in the previous lecture, Alan talked about a variety of uh, modern techniques for detecting signals of adaptive evolution in patterns of genomic variation. In this lecture, um, we're going to talk about a consequence for variation generally of adaptation going on throughout the genome. Uh, and this is the uh, process that Gillespie, the author of your textbook, has um, called genetic draft. What is genetic draft? It's not a fundamental force of evolution or a fundamental process like mutation, selection, drift, or perhaps migration. It's an effect, um, a very general and widespread effect, of mutations at a selected locus that reduces variation at nearby linked loci, thereby reducing the apparent population size n. And Alan did show you one of the key uh, figures from Gillespie's chapter on this, uh, which we'll come back to um, later in the present lecture. Why should we care about this, and why should we devote an entire lecture to it? The neutral theory, remember, predicts that at mutation drift equilibrium, DNA polymorphism should be proportional to the population size n. Um, and the key um, relationship, which has been understood for decades, is that theta, defined as 4 times n times mu, where again mu is the mutation rate per generation, at a diploid locus, should um, be a closely approximate pi, the um, nucleotide level diversity or heterozygosity at a diploid locus um, at neutral sites nearby. But it's not. This is the puzzle that gives rise um, to the term genetic draft and to this um, extended treatment of it. The problem is that this theoretical expectation is not satisfied by real data, not even approximately, and especially in mitochondria, uh, which we'll focus on a couple of times. So the reason for going into this um, subject at length is that we hope if we can figure out why the neutral theory fails in this way, we'll learn something important about genetics and ecology, that is about mutation and selection as um, mediated by real ecology in the real world. One place to start is with this key figure from a great paper published about 14 years ago in science by a group of French researchers, Bazin, Glamine, and Gaultier. And they um, mined the databases to produce um, a graph showing the following really fascinating pattern, which is that um, large higher taxa, actually classes of animals, um, MA for mammalia, P for Pisces, fishes, S for um, saurians, sauropsida, reptiles and birds, that's S, A for amphibia, um, C for crustacea, I for insects, E for echinoderms, and MO for mollusks. Um, do show um, a correlation between synonymous site polymorphism, um, which they call pi sub s, that's again the nucleotide level heterozygosity or nucleotide diversity. There is a correlation between that over these large um, taxonomic categories between pi sub s as um, estimated from coding sequences in the databases for nuclear genes, and allozyme heterozygosity, estimated in that old-fashioned way from those starch gels of enzyme loci that were run um, over and over and over again on all manner of taxa 
back in the 60s and 70s. So there is variation. Um, mollusks, echinoderms, insects, and crustaceans have higher average levels of enzyme, um, amino acid level polymorphism than do these large bodied um, um, taxa mammals in particular. We are at the bottom end of the allozyme heterozygosity scale, and we're also at the bottom end of the nuclear uh, synonymous site polymorphism scale at a little less on average than half a percent. Okay, whereas these other taxa have more. All right, so these two scales um, are correlated with each other, and very crudely speaking, they fit the expectation based on notions of typical um, effective population sizes, which we imagine to be generally smaller um, for mammals and fish and lizards and birds um, than for insects, certainly crustaceans um, in the marine environment can be very uh, numerous, and mollusks, um, snails, and so on, which many of which are marine and can have enormous population sizes. Okay. But the upper curve shows the mitochondrial synonymous site um, polymorphism for these same taxa. And look at the disconnect. Essentially, all eight or nine of these higher level animal taxa have, on average, about the same mitochondrial synonymous site polymorphism, a little less than 10%. It's quite high, in part because mitochondrial genomes do have, as we've pointed out, high um, mutation rates compared to nuclear genes. So the fact that, on average, the mitochondrial um, heterozygosity is higher than nuclear heterozygosity was not news. That did not get this report into science. We'd known that for a long time. It's the fact that. Um, in, there's no effect of taxon, which would appear to have something to do with effective population size for the mitochondria sequences when there is for the nuclear genes, at, as estimated by synonymous site um, diversity or um, enzyme um, heterozygosity by that classic technique. All right, so this was a conundrum. And um, this paper, which is short, and you might enjoy reading it, actually, maybe you should, um, argues uh, for a draft-like explanation. Okay, so that's it. The invertebrates have um, no higher mitochondrial diversity than do the vertebrates with their smaller um, population sizes, um, but they do have um, higher nuclear diversity, as estimated by allozymes, or a synonymous site nucleotide polymorphism. So here's another data set that I've worked on to help you see how um, what a problem we have on our hands for the neutral theory. Um, this is Euphausia superba, Antarctic krill. Um, they may well be the most abundant animal on Earth. Now, they're a key link in the Southern Ocean ecosystem. Um, they, they occur by the trillions of post-larval individuals in the Southern Ocean. Um, their total estimated biomass is something between 1 and 4 times 8 to the metric, eight, 10 to the 8th metric tons, um, which is similar to that of the human biomass, um, which I estimate to be right in the middle of that range, a little less than 3 times 10 to the 8th metric tons. So we and they may be the most massive animal species on the planet. Very conservatively, I would estimate their mitochondrial theta, which remember would be 2 times the number of females times the mutation rate, since we're not diploid and only females transmit mitochondria. Okay, so that would be like 2 times 10 to the 12th female individuals, say, um, 
times 5 times 10 to the minus 9th, which would be a, a low ball estimate of the mitochondrial mutation rate. So that would be a theta of 10 to the 4th, that is 10,000. But in fact, the synonymous site nucleotide diversity for their mitochondrial genomes, which we sequenced lots of, um, is actually on the low side, um, 0.03, less than the averages presented in the uh, um, Bazan et al. paper. So here's our problem. Theta, the real theta, two times the number of females times the mutation rate is something like a third of a million times greater than the synonymous site nucleotide diversity or if you like heterozygosity, the expected heterozygosity of mitochondrial genomes. This is an enormous discrepancy between theory and fact. How do we explain it? And how do we explain the peculiar shape of this um, krill mitochondrial um, gene genealogy, which we've estimated very accurately with large amounts of sequence data. It's way too short and it's way too peculiarly shaped. It's not, a, by, it's not remotely a nuclear genealogy. So what's going on? Okay, so here's Gillespie's draft model. We have um, in the simplest possible version of it, two loci, a selected locus, which he calls A in this figure from chapter four in your textbook. Okay, the A locus, we can have alleles A1 and A2, and um, they, the action there affects um, diversity at the B locus, which is neutral, and it too will have alleles B1 and B2. And of course, um, we'll have four gamete types, um, X1 through X4, as you've met before, um, and we'll specify some recombination probability, R, little r, between these two loci. They're on a nuclear chromosome. Okay, that's the setup. So here's Gillespie's story that um, sets off this analysis. Step zero, we imagine the population fixed for the A2 allele at the selected locus, and it's polymorphic for B1 and B2 at the neutral locus nearby. The frequency of the B1 allele, let's call P sub B, the frequency of B2 allele, of course, will be Q sub B, which is 1 minus P sub B. Okay, in step one, there's a mutation to the selectively favored A1 allele. The environment, we suppose, has changed, or for some other reason, um, the population, the A2 allele for which the population is fixed isn't ideal at present. Finally, the mutation happens. But here's Gillespie's key question. On which genetic background does it happen? Does it happen on the B1 background? That would be that one. That is, does it happen in linkage with B1 or in linkage with B2, then creating the gamete type X2? Um, and then we ask what happens as a consequence of those two alternative um, places where it might first happen. The lucky B allele, whichever it is, is going to hitch a ride, hence hitchhike, with the selectively favored A1 allele, which is going to go to fixation because it's just absolutely better. Okay? And so here's, the, again, figure 4.5 from the textbook. Um, showing how this plays out as a function of which um, linkage is the original one and what is the amount of recombination between the two loci. So the hitchhiking continues as long as the lucky B allele remains in linkage disequilibrium with A1. And so um, as a consequence, this is Gillespie's point, on average, the B locus variation is reduced. So the selective sweep sweeps out the pre-existing B locus variation um, 
if that's closely linked to the site, to the locus, the A locus where um, a selective sweep is happening. The, um, at the B locus, the initial heterozygosity is in Gillespie's example um, 0.42 because the allele frequencies are 0.3 and 0.7 for the B alleles. Uh, 0.3 is the initial frequency of B1. If um, the favored allele happens on the B1 background, the frequency of B1 goes up uh, because the advance of A1 uh, carries it there. If there's no recombination to speak of between them, the B1 allele will go completely to fixation. And so at the end of the process, at the end of the sweep, 2PQ will be equal to zero. The, um, the heterozygosity that existed was simply swept away. If um, there is some recombination such that, say, the ratio of the recombination rate between A and B to the selective advantage of the A1 allele, and hence the speed with which A1 sweeps, is a number like 0.05. Um, the expected result would be this curve, which raises um, B1 to a higher frequency, but doesn't take it all the way to, to fixation. Um, I should have pointed out that if it's linked to B2 and very tightly, then the same thing will happen in the other direction as happened in this first case, and 2PQ will be close to zero at the end of the selective sweep um, in the other direction. Okay, but um, if there is some recombination, then 2PQ will be reduced, but not all the way to zero. Um, in the case where it's um, linked to the B2 allele, B1 will come down and 2PQ will be like 0.2 at the end of the ride. And um, in the other case where it's um, a, a linked to B1, 2PQ will be around 0.4, which is very similar. Um, to what it was before the sweep started. So in this case, there's not much of an effect, um, but this is only one of four possible cases. So the average effect is um, a reduction in um, diversity at nearby neutral linked loci. That's, that's Gillespie's argument. Um, I've noted that Gillespie's notation in this figure is quite confusing because Gillespie himself was confused by his own notation. He seems to have mentally mixed up the name of the B2 allele with the allele frequency. It's actually not called, um, it shouldn't be called P2. It should be called, as I've written it, um, P of the B1 allele. All right. So um, here's the figure that Alan showed in the previous lecture. It's the ratio of the final heterozygosity at a neutral linked locus as a function of its distance to the selected locus undergoing a sweep measured by this ratio of R, the recombination fraction or probability per generation to S, the selective advantage of the sweeping allele, which is important because that determines how long uh, the sweep takes, or conversely, how quickly it happens. And so if it happens quickly, because S is a big number and or R is a small number, then um, the heterozygosity as a fraction of what it was um, to begin with will be hugely reduced down to potentially something like zero for sites that are very near a strongly selected um, A locus. Um, but um, if that uh, ratio becomes as large, say, as a tenth or 0.2, then the um, depression, uh, the sweeping out of linked variation will be very slight. And most of the um, 
heterozygosity that existed before the sweep started will still be there. Um, in vertebrates, including mammals like us, a typical uh, recombination rate on a per base pair basis would be like 10 to the minus eighth. So if we suppose a typical selectively advantaged allele um, causing such a sleep, sweep has um, a selective advantage of the order of 10 to the minus third, um, then R over S would be frequently a number on the order of say 10 to the minus fifth per base pair. Um, so um, for an R over S ratio like 0.1, you'd have to be within 10,000 base pairs of the selected locus. That's because 10 to the minus fifth times 10 to the fourth is 0.1. Okay, so as a rough rule of thumb, we would expect sites within about 10 kilobases of a swept um, site with a, a sort of intermediate um, strong selection, selective advantage um, to be um, quite significantly depleted of their um, original neutral standing variation. Let's stop there and take a break and uh, pick up with part two of the lecture in which we'll look at some um, empirical evidence beginning with the lactase region again um, that um, seems to uh, satisfy Gillespie's model.